Thank you to SIGA and its chairman and CEO, Emmanuel Macedo de Medeiros for their invitation to speak at SIGA Sports Integrity Week. I appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this week long event and truly support SIGA's vision of sport played and governed under the highest integrity standards, free from unethical and criminal activity to ensure its positive impact to benefit all citizens. The integrity of competition has always been an integral part of organized sports for as long as professional and collegiate leagues and competitions have been in existence and long before gambling was legalized in jurisdictions around the world. We have to remember that it actually took the Black Sox scandal in 1919 for Major League Baseball to appoint its first commissioner, who at the time was a United States federal judge. Sports integrity has surely hit other bumps since that baseball scandal more than 100 years ago. However, we have definitely grown and learned from the mistakes over that time. While integrity in sports has made great strides in the last century, it is clear that there is much more work to be done. And just last month, your poll published a report related to the involvement of organized crime and the corruption of sports. As an independent and neutral multi-stakeholder coalition committed to safeguarding the integrity of sporting competition, SEGA has made it clear that it is willing to actively cooperate with governmental agencies, law enforcement, and sports league to rid criminal activity from sporting events. This effort will require vigilance, agility, and resources to address crime and corruption on an international level, both in person and across technological platforms that seemingly involve on a daily basis. Through effective legislation and government regulation, Nevada's sports wagering industry has been a success story and an example for other jurisdictions to follow. Legalized sports wagering is an aspect of everyday life here in Nevada, and its long history and battles along the way include stories from which movies have been made. But today, as other jurisdictions have legalized sports betting, we share our model and offer our assistance to allow this industry to grow in a way that is responsible, safe, and properly regulated. I am proud of the state of Nevada's role as a regulatory leader in sports integrity. Our model of strict regulation and oversight has helped enhance the reputation of sports wagering. Because of our gold standard in sports betting and gaming regulation, the National Collegiate Athletic Association, also known as the NCAA, has allowed conference basketball tournaments to be played in Las Vegas and proportional sports leagues, such as the Women's National Basketball Association, the National Hockey League, and the National Football League have all expanded to the state of Nevada. Our regulated sports betting model is one that has stood the test of time and can act as a framework for jurisdictions around the world but it is also agile enough to adapt and change as lawmakers and regulators see fit. We have established rigorous, rigorous standards for operators, coupled with the flexibility for innovation and prudent expansion. For example, a decade ago, Nevada authorized online or mobile account wagering systems under specific and stringent parameters and oversight. Then in 2019, when the United States Supreme Court ruled that the Professional and Amateur Sports Protection Act of 1992 was unconstitutional, the Nevada Gaming Control Board acted quickly to ensure that Nevada's laws and regulations provided the board with the tools necessary to regulate a market that was primed for expansion, which has come to fruition now with almost 19 jurisdictions in the United States with legal and operational sports betting. That same year, the Nevada legislature approved statutory changes requested by the Gaming Control Board to Nevada's wire intercept statute. These changes incorporated illegal gambling into the wire intercept statute, giving the board the authority to bolster its ability to combat illegal bookmaking. Just as before the repeal of PASPA, the board continues to monitor issues of consumer protection related to those individuals and companies who hold themselves out to be sports betting experts, especially now that such people can apply their supposed trade across jurisdictions. History and experience have informed us that regulatory bodies need broad authority to promulgate regulations in order to maintain public confidence, and the Nevada Gaming Control Board will continue to advocate for such statutory authority. It should not be a, a surprise to anyone viewing today that enforcement is the key to success here in Nevada. Jurisdictions that have legalized sports wagering sh could, should give just as much attention to enforcement as they do an operator's initial entrance into the market. Jurisdictions that regulate sports wagering should have effective criminal laws on the books prohibiting illicit activities such as sports bribery and illegal bookmaking, and with the authority to impose penalties strong enough to deter such activity from the outset. Law enforcement and regulatory agents need the requisite tools and training to conduct both covert and overt operations to stop illegal activity. Furthermore, cooperation with legal operators 
domestic and foreign law enforcement, and sports integrity coalitions around the world is key to upholding and ensuring the integrity of sports. Legal sports betting operators have been instrumental in exposing attempts to fix sporting events by reporting unusual betting patterns to regulators. For example, it was actually a legal sports book in Nevada that first alerted the board and the FBI to the Arizona State basketball scandal in 1994 that led to the sentencing of five individuals involved in that point shaving scheme. After legal sports books provided data which detailed information about approximately $1 million being bet on a game that would normally generate $40,000 in wagers, the board studied hours of surveillance coverage to detect the bad actors. Collaboration among regulators across jurisdictions is also key to prevent betting scandals and money laundering efforts by criminals. There is no reason that an expanded sports betting landscape has to lead to expanding criminal activity. And I was pleased to see that this week's participants include faculty from UNLV's International Gaming Institute and Center for Gaming Regulation, which has been an integral part in encouraging communication among regulators. Unfortunately, not every bad actor can be rooted out before it takes hold and adversely affects organized sports, sports wagering, or the integrity of both. We did not learn of this bad actor from our enforcement efforts or from a tip from a book. This bad actor was COVID-19 and it shook our industry. In March of this year, the spread of the novel coronavirus that causes COVID-19 forced sports leagues around the world to postpone and cancel seasons and the games of the 32nd Olympiad to be pushed back for at least a year. The sports wagering market went dark. Regulators and operators in each sports wagering jurisdiction began to wonder when or if leagues would return to play and if the industry could survive a month or year long hiatus. If we know anything, we know that the gaming industry is resilient. We go forth and we continue to work on solutions and entertain new ideas in the detailed, cautious, and controlled manner that we always have. Our collective focus should remain on sharing regulatory practices, working proactively with sports leagues and integrity bodies, and establishing a framework for information sharing and analysis. The sports wagering industry is growing and moving so fast that these remarks may be obsolete in the near future. However, I want to commend SEGA and its leadership in bringing regulators, operators, and academics and others here to discuss these issues and support its core principles for sports integrity. This forum, this forum demonstrates that it is our collective commitment and acknowledgement of our shared responsibility to continue to protect the integrity of sports around the world. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the SEGA Sports Integrity Week. Hi, Sandra. Hi, everybody. Delighted to have you here. I'm glad you make it. Uh, you could make it possible. Uh, we have so much to talk about. Uh, we live uh, very uh, peculiar times, very challenging times, when uh, humankind is perhaps at the brink of uh, a bigger danger than uh, we expected, uh, with an overwhelming impact across all economic sectors, and no doubt, uh, sports betting and gambling were one of those sectors. Uh, you are the first African-American woman uh, as uh, chairwoman of the Nevada Gaming Control Board, the second woman in all its history after Becky Harris. How do you feel um, uh, in, in this role uh, after you have taken, uh, you know, uh, taken um, uh, the role and being appointed. How do you see the experience? What have been the main challenges that you have dealt with uh, and the results that you uh, you have already uh, made possible following this, uh, this period of, uh, of chairmanship? Well, thank you, Emmanuel, for um, the opportunity to sit down and talk to you and, and talk to your members and participants, um, the Sports Integrity Forum. I appreciate the invitation. You know, um, obviously, it was a huge honor just to be appointed um, to, the, to be chair of the Gaming Control Board. It was certainly a surprise for me. I was on the Gaming Commission prior to be appointed, but in Nevada, the Gaming Control Board is the 24-7, you know, day-to-day -day regulator. And uh, being a native Nevadan, you know, I grew up here. And so um, I understand the importance of the gaming industry to Nevada's economy. Uh, my mother worked in the gaming industry as I was growing up. And I know how much it's benefited so many families and Nevadans. And so to be able to be the chief regulator um, in Nevada was an incredible honor. And to have also um, be in a position to make history with the first African, being the first African-American um, board chair um, is something that 
albeit it's something I don't take very lightly. I understand that um, a lot of people are watching and I understand that this position um, definitely affects so many children and others who want to have a, a future, not only in the gaming industry, but in gaming regulation as well. And it's an honor and a privilege that I definitely do not take lightly. Um, with regard to my first couple of years, it's definitely been a tumultuous couple of years. I think um, I wouldn't speak for myself, but any regulator or anyone in business definitely had plans for 2020. And unfortunately, with um, the novel coronavirus, it took a left turn. Um, but I will say that even through um, the COVID-19 challenges, we were able to still pass um, good and sound um, regulations. And most recently, one regarding cashless wagering. We have allowed cashless wagering at table games. We expanded that to have a framework to allow cashless wagering at machines as well. Um, definitely working with a lot of our gaming manufacturers and seeing more interest from operators to be able to provide more technological options on the floor. Um, so I was very open um, when I was appointed in 2019 that I wanted to not only modernize our regulations, but also make sure we, that Nevada is being able to build a bridge between new technological advancements um, and the gaming mm -hmm. regulation. And I hope to continue to do that. Yeah, but what, what a period we are facing. Uh, I could not help uh, reminding that, uh, you know, in 2018, uh, when uh, when the, um, when possible was repealed, the industry was booming, uh, and uh, and uh, and the, the U.S. Uh, betting industry cashed in 1.8 billion U.S. dollars, uh, which was uh, and perhaps the the growing amount on, on sports on sports betting related um, uh, money was uh, uh, as a consequence of the repeal of PASPA. Where is the industry now? Uh, all sectors have been affected. Uh, we have uh, we have uh, estimated that, uh, that sports betting, online sports betting, has uh, been more resilient than other sectors. But what is the current state of affairs? Where are we currently? Well, in Nevada, obviously, we are the largest land-based casino presence in the United States. Um, you know, our brick and mortar facilities have always been the major draw, not only to Las Vegas but to the state of Nevada as well. Um, February of 2020 was one of our best months ever. And obviously when we had to close um, casinos in March um, based on the governor's uh, orders and directive, that was something that had never been done. We had many properties that never even had to lock their doors because they'd never been closed before. So obviously um, this has had a drastic, a drastic effect on the gaming industry. Now, with regard to sports wagering specifically, we did allow, um, continue to allow online wagering while the brick and mortar facilities were closed. Um, we had some creative um, operators that would allow kind of drive-through um, signups to be able to do that. Obviously, if you have to be in Nevada in order to place a wager online. Um, although sports wagering and is not, um, I think we're still at about less than 3% of Nevada's revenue, it is growing. And obviously with it growing in the United States and in, in the world, we know and our operators know that it is something that players and customers want. And the um, increase of personal device wagering has increased over 300% in the last couple of years. And so we're, we wanna make sure that people still have those options. We made sure that people still have those options, albeit sports were not, um, unfortunately also were not uh, being played between March, not many were being played between March and May, but we saw some creative options and um, more requests from books to be able to wager on things such as esports. Um, within the last mm -hmm. four years, we probably had less than five requests we wager on esports, but within the March to probably July timeframe, we probably had about six or seven. And so operators were looking at different ways to be able to get customers other opportunities um, to wager on events. And we just have to make sure as regulators that there is a clear and consistent and um, proper framework to be able to do so. Mm -hmm. are, the, are the casinos now open? Yes, the casinos were able to reopen on June 4th. Um, we, and for our July month, we actually had about a 20% 26% decline from gaming revenue from July of 2020 to July of 2019. However, as you know, in Las Vegas, our non-gaming revenue has exceeded our gaming revenue uh, for quite some time now because um, obviously with the options of conventions and shows and restaurants and, and fine dining and other amenities. Unfortunately though, although our gaming revenue has only decreased about 26%, um, we still are not at a point where we have conventions or um, large events because we're currently still at a 50 um, person um, per gathering limit. 
Um, but hopefully as we get a better control of the coronavirus, not only in the United States, but here in Nevada, we can slowly begin to open things up. But as, it's, as we currently um, sit right now in September, we're still at a 50 person maximum for um, public or private gatherings. However, the gaming floor is able to be at 50% occupancy. So um, we've in encouraged people to use surveillance techniques and slot accounting systems to ensure that 50% um, you know, of their games or tables are not being run at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I suppose that uh, the reopening of the casinos was something that you, uh, uh, the Nevada Gaming Control Board, dedicated particular attention and, and focus to, uh, okay. issuing guidelines and uh, you know, and working hand in hand with the, all the operators to ensure the, the you know, the 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 health, the public health uh, um, priorities and interests were safeguarded. Could you tell us a little bit about what were those recommendations, those guidelines? the key must implement things that uh, the casinos have put in place to ensure that the, uh, you know, the, uh, the consumers can uh, return to the casinos uh, with uh, full confidence. Absolutely, Emmanuel, and thank you for the opportunity to even address this because I'm truly proud of our state and not only um, from a health and human services standpoint, but also of the gaming operators as well. You know, in Nevada, it's a, if you have a privileged gaming license, they realize it's a privilege and they have to go through a very significant investigative process to get a license. And so I can say with certainty and confidence that I know that our gaming operators and our gaming licensees are taking their responsibility to ensure that their customers are in a safe environment um, in incredibly seriously. So the governor actually decided when, um, when to open things and when to close things, but tasked the gaming control board with the um, responsibility to actually enact guidelines or regulations on how um, these properties could reopen safely. So our role was to develop and mandate universal requirements for all gaming properties prior to their reopening. Um, in Nevada, you know, we have everything from large strip resorts, but we also govern, you know, smaller taverns that have less than 50 machines. So we have to, over 2,000 licensees. So we had to create some type of framework that um, everyone could be sure that there were consistent guidelines in order to comply. And so it could be everything from temperature checks when you go onto a resort property. Obviously, we wanted to have an ability, you know, it's, it's about 110 degrees here right now. So we knew with temperature checks, they needed to have areas where they could have cooling stations to ensure that, you know, they weren't just overheated because of the heat, but actually, if there were a potential medical issue, that that could be addressed as well. We worked very closely with our hospitals and medical professionals before developing these guidelines um, and, and these protocols. And of course, the governor mandated that everyone in the state um, wear face coverings. And so that was required of employees on day one, um, June 4th, when we did reopen. It's now been obviously extended, uh, expanded to all customers. The Gaming Control Board also required masks to be worn at table games um, as well um, when we reopened. And so obviously uh, consistent sanitization um, ensuring that people are socially distanced um, at restaurants and your tables, having you know groups of no more than six and ensuring that they're socially distanced as well. Um, those are things, and, and testing. Testing has been a huge component. And a lot of our larger operators made it a point to discuss and address the fact that they were going to have their employees tested prior to coming to work. Our actual um, Nevada legislature actually passed a bill within the last month that would give businesses certain um, liability protections with regard to the coronavirus, but it also, that same bill included additional protections and regulations that were gonna be passed by Health and Human Services with regard to disinfecting, cleaning and sanitization standards for public accommodations and hotels and resort hotels as well. So I think Nevada has done a great job, not just from the gaming regulatory context with regard to the Gaming Control Board and the commission, but also with regard to the legislature and Health and Human Services to ensure that we are going to be welcome, um, able to welcome back um, visitors from all around the world when we're at a point where we can fully reopen again. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I take my head off because uh, I know how tremendous that effort uh, must have been and how challenging were the circumstances to have to, to decide to make decisions and implement all these dynamics and, and procedures. So uh, uh, to you and, and the members of your team and everybody involved, I, I would like to commend you for that uh, Herculean effort, but the size of one. So thank, thank you. you, Emmanuel. Very much appreciated. There was no playbook for dealing with the pandemic, but I know we all work together collectively to make sure that we can um, safely not only invite um, guests back to Las Vegas, but keep our employees safe as well. That's that's excellent. And how do you see the situation across the country? Because the 
the reports that we get from the U.S. are somehow worrying, you know, uh, fragmented approaches, uh, uh, tensions, uh, conflicts, uh, division, um, which does not inspire, you know, uh, um, a feeling of tranquility and uh, and confidence. Uh, have you been in touch with the other um, uh, regulators in other states? Uh, how are the, the, the dialogue procedures in place with the authorities? How do you see this working as a nation? Um, you know, unfortunately, there isn't a um, strategic or detailed federal response. However, I know every state has received um, the White House guidelines and obviously guide guidelines from the CDC. With regard to my communications with other regulators, you know, it, it is great to say that, yes, we do communicate. And I think um, the consistent theme, obviously, with all gaming properties is so making sure people are socially distanced and making sure people wear face coverings and obviously, you know, washing their hands. Now, with regard to Las Vegas, because we do have a, um, our, our demographic of our customers is not just local. That may be the case in other states. And so it's really important to have that contact tracing element as well to ensure that we have the ability to know who was in Las Vegas and who they were in contact with. And the state actually launched a, a COVID tracking app to be able to um, share anonymous data if you come into contact with someone who happens to test positive. So those are things that may be specific to Nevada. However, the gaming regulators in other states, we all reopened at different times. Um, some of us, you know, for, for Nevada, we are an independent agency, um, so we can operate separately. However, we obviously are very respectful of the governor's guidelines and are complying with those and expecting our licensees to comply with those. In other U.S. jurisdictions, some of them fall under the attorney general. Some of them are actually part of the governor's cabinet. And so the regulatory structure, reporting structure is a little bit different, but we all communicate on a consistent basis. And I actually want to give kudos to um, UNLV's International Gaming Institute and Center for Gaming Regulation because they also um, are able to facilitate conversations and give us a forum to be able to exchange best practices as well. But it has definitely been a um, struggle, for lack of a better term, where I know many U.S. jurisdictions, but we're, we're definitely working together and ensuring that when people come back to enjoy some semblance of entertainment, that they're able to do so safely. Well, no doubt that the Nevada Gaming Control Board has been at the forefront uh, in this field for, for many, many years, and you have been a trailblazer, uh, I believe, in the process of uh, opening uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, sports market to uh, to, the, to the betting the gambling industry. Um, and I remember being uh, uh, in uh, in Las Vegas discussing the uh, uh, the pros and cons of opening or or, or not the uh, the sports uh, market uh, to wagering, and uh, I remember referring, which is for me uh, uh, written in stone since our early start dealing with uh, with issues related to sport and and sports betting twenty some years ago, which is uh, the the regulation of the market is much better than. Uh, a system that uh, cannot handle properly uh, illegal betting, unlawful betting, and other phenomena that uh, happen uh, beyond the curtains. Uh, a system that allows consumer protection, which is the second biggest principle in my playbook. Consumer protection uh, against addiction. Consumer protection in order to save uh, the youngsters. Um, effective policies and uh, procedures and initiatives to prevent and fight uh, the pernicious uh, effect and influence of transnational organized crime. Um, that comes with a huge constellation, concerted, uh, coordinated global response. Uh, things in Europe, I must say, are not in the state that I would like them to see. Uh, so when I first uh, approached the Nevada Game Control Board, I approached with the uh, intention to learn, uh, to absorb best practices that we were putting in place in order to inspire solutions in Europe. But uh, now I see also the opposite, which is instead of, uh, when I look at the sports landscape, instead of seeing a, a, a common front uh, within sport, I see also fragmentation in the relation between sports competition organizers and and sports betting operators. How do you see, also learning from the previous uh, two years, taking lessons from those two years, how do you see uh, lessons of success and also lessons where improvement 
uh, is required as far as the EU um, betting market, the sports betting market is concerned. You know, I actually think the successes and, and um, things that can be learned are actually going to be one of the same. And, and it's going to go back to the conversation we just had about regulators and being able to share information. You know, Nevada, we are different in that we have been able to legally do this for decades. And we have now so many yep. US jurisdictions that are coming online and, um, you know, they have good frameworks in place on paper, but obviously we didn't get to the point that we're at in 2020 um, overnight. You know, we had some missteps, we had some issues, and we were able to learn from those over, you know, since for the last, what, five, six decades and have been able to learn from them. I'm able um, as, as the chair to come into a role with a well-oiled machine, an enforcement division and an investigations division, an audit division that has been, um, building on these practices and creating technical standards and creating minimum control standards and creating relationships with our federal partners and our neighboring jurisdictions over these years. And it's going to take time. And unfortunately, um, you get the experience because of missteps and because of some wins. And um, I think that it's going to be imperative um, to those, for those jurisdictions that are just now coming online to take the time to build the relationships, not only with other regulators and other law enforcement agencies, but also uh, federal partners as well. You know, the Gaming Control Board is on many federal task forces with um, our Federal Bureau of Investigation and our Internal Revenue Service. We make sure we're consistently communicating with the security chiefs. We have regular meetings with them weekly with all of our large gaming properties. And so having those relationships, that consistent communication is incredibly important. And that honestly just takes time, Emmanuel, to build over time. Um, but those relationships with those with the books and with the operators, they are many times in Nevada, because we have so many licensees, our first line of defense. Enforcement is such an important key because they have to know that they will be held accountable if they're not following the regulations. And I think because that expectation has been set and it has been tested um, so many times in Nevada, that is why our licensees understand that they need to self-report or they need to even let us know if something isn't looking quite right. So we have the ability to investigate. And even if it's nine times out of 10, it comes of nothing, that's fine. But that communication and that alert is important, not just with operators and regulators, but with integrity um, associations, and honestly with patrons as well. Um, the patron dispute process that we have and the consumer protection elements, those two build over time. And that also is as a result of a strong relationship with our attorney general's office to be able to prosecute those matters, those matters. So it is truly um, a collaborative effort, not only among the different divisions within the Gaming Control Board, but with our law enforcement partners across the state of Nevada and honestly across um, the United States and internationally as well. Um, so I think the positives are though that we have this template or this um, process that's kind of in place on paper. The challenge is going to be ensuring that states that they come online are implementing those and truly strengthening those relationships, the communication and their enforcement efforts as well. Mm -hmm. I, I, um, I truly think that uh, what you're doing is a phenomenal effort and the progress that you are making uh, in, in uh, such a new landscape uh, with new states opening the market, with new operators coming into the market, uh, with the relations and tensions which are, at the end of the day, normal between sports competition organizers, the leagues and the, and the unions and the, and, and, the, and the betting companies. The way you are dealing with this it shows not only pragmatism, but shows vision and, uh, you know, and, and strong, strong resolve. Uh, I wish I could uh, share the same feeling regarding Europe, uh, which is my, my the continent that I live in, uh, because I see the same problems that I was discussing 20, 25 years ago still uh, to, to, to be solved. I see law enforcement with lack of means, and by lack of means, I mean legislative means that give them the power and the tools, uh, but also lack of resources, financial resources, human resources, uh, expertise to win this fight uh, for clean sport, for, for sport with integrity, uh, keeping crime away uh, against the pernicious uh, influence of transnational organized crime. I just wanted to make sure that I was very clear that I commended SIGA and all of your efforts, not only in Europe and what you're trying to do in North America to at least have um, standard sports betting um, integrity standards. That's incredibly important. I applaud you and your organization for doing so. Uh, but with regard to the United States, I, I do think 
just because each state is is different, um, different with regard to their um, relationships with leagues and other betting industries. And again, like I mentioned, the regulatory framework as to certain gaming commissions or lottery commissions or sports wagering, wagering um, entities being having a different reporting structure. In Nevada, we're, we're very independent and um, we want that freedom to be able to adopt those regulations as we see fit with the flexibility to be able to adapt if needed. Yeah. Well, uh, Sandra, thank you very much for the, for the reference you made to SIG and our efforts to ensure that we have a global, robust, consistent, coordinated approach to the issues that arise from, uh, from sports betting. There are tremendous positive uh, uh, externalities and benefits, but there are also challenges. And without uh, integrity in sport, there is no business, there is no profitability, there is no sports betting. So we want to preserve the integrity of sport in order to uh, ensure that sport can play its role in global society and in the global economy. And as I used to say, for global problems, you need global solutions and you need a common strategy, a united front. Hence the creation of SIGA and the work that we do in which you are also an active agent. And I want to thank the Nevada Game and Control Board uh, and all the members of your team for the invaluable support uh, for the uh, best practice exchange for all the very positive and constructive collaboration that we have had throughout the years, because I believe that that, that, that is the seed uh, that will ensure the success of our joint efforts in the US. And as you know, we have set up SIG America based in DC, but spanning throughout the country so that those very same universal standards can be translated into practice applied and implemented by the sports organizations and other uh, relevant authorities. And on that contest, the Nevada Gaming Control Board has been a true force, a true ally, a true partner. And for that, I would like to commend you on behalf of the whole community. We, um, we thank you and, uh, and we look forward to continue this excellent uh, collaboration. And in the meantime, one final ask from my side. How do you see uh, the future ahead, because we are living in a defining moment, no doubt a huge unprecedented crisis. But I always believe that crisis, even as the Chinese uh, say, is a mix of uh, danger and opportunity. I believe that we are well aware of the danger and we have had a taste recently and we are now preparing to a second wave. But there is opportunity. How do you see it and, and what is your advice? What needs to get done to get the industry with the highest standards that they, the, as, as, as it deserves for the benefit of all those who like sports and like to place their own back? You know, I obviously think that this is, um, the pandemic is something that people knew could happen what was not foreseen, but I'm incredibly optimistic that this industry will be able to rebound and succeed because it honestly always have has. Um, with respect to Nevada, obviously we had um, a horrible, horrible mass shooting on October 1st um, a couple of years ago and the industry was able to rebound, work together and ensure that there were gonna be safe practices and security measures. And they worked with the Gaming Control Board and our departments of emergency management for that as well. Obviously we suffered a horrible recession um, in 2008, 2000, well, 2010, and the industry was able to rebound from that and learned lessons from that as well. I think that we are going to come out of this COVID pandemic um, brighter, more aware, more innovative. Um, I'm working closely with um, and on a prize committee with the UNLV um, um, Lee Business School with innovations on how um, hospitality is going to change and evolve in COVID. People are there are going to be some things, even with the vaccine, that will still take its place, whether it be needs to be disinfected, people to so continue to social distance, and just have more awareness on how to protect themselves. And I personally think that the hospitality and the gaming industry will be the ones leading that charge to show how we can bring back larger events in a very safe and controlled manner. And I think that um, we're going to have a lot of people that are going to be ready to come back to Las Vegas or to travel or to go to games and have that um, athletic and sports industry um, will we'll definitely thrive again. We're just going to have to get through these tough times, listen to the science, understand the data, and um, find ways to uh, be able to 
truly, truly reopen, enjoy sports again, enjoy gaming and hospitality again. But I do think we're going to come out of this stronger and better as we always have in the past. And on that note, Sandra, what's left for me is a final word of appreciation and recognition. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for sharing your, your, uh, your vision and your insights on the current state of affairs and the future ahead. We have a, a lot to continue talking about. We shall do that. But in the meantime, I wish you well and uh, hope that you can enjoy the Sport Integrity Week because it is also for that purpose that uh, it is offered to the, to the whole world. So thank you very much. Thank you, Emmanuel.